Okay, so you've probably heard the word epidural before. And if you've had an epidural before, then you probably have a positive association with the word. But if you've never had one done before, you're probably scared. In this video, I'm gonna be discussing the two main types of epidural. When people say epidural, what do they actually mean? And I'll be talking about the indications for it, as well as risks and complications so that you have a better understanding before signing up for an epidural or if you have an epidural coming up. All right, welcome back to the Dr. Painkiller channel. If you're new here, my name is Dr. Sater. I am a double-boarded pain specialist and neurologist. Okay, so first of all, let's define the word epidural. Just like when you have an IV, so if you're having an IV placement, which a lot of people have heard of the term, basically an IV is when you're inserting a line or a needle inside the vein, intravenous. Now, similarly, an epidural is really referring to the location of where that needle or catheter or injection is. So what's the epidural space? Now, to understand what that is, let's refer to this model right here. So the brain itself and the spinal cord are essentially swimming in a fluid called the cerebrospinal fluid. And all of those are basically enclosed in meninges, which is essentially like an envelope. So if you imagine that you have a letter inside an envelope, essentially the brain is the letter and the envelope is the meninges or dura around it. Now, outside of this dura is where you have the epidural. So the epidural space, also known as extradural space, which essentially means it's outside of the dura. So also outside of where the brain and the spinal cord are swimming. Okay, so what is that epidural space made of? Basically, it's made of a lot of fat. There's also some veins, small vessels inside that space. It is not a dense space, and that is important, and we'll talk about why in the technique in a second. All right, so when people talk about an epidural, usually they're referring to one of two things. Either an epidural for analgesia, during labor and delivery or postoperatively for pain control after, let's say, abdominal surgery. That is one type of epidural. And then the other type of epidural that we talk about is an epidural steroid injection, ESI, which is really the type of injection that we give for patients who have back pain and sciatica pain for pain relief. Now, the two share a lot of similarities, but they also have a lot of differences between them. So I'm going to cover that. Let's start by talking about the epidural that people refer to during labor and delivery. Okay, so during labor and delivery, the kind of epidural that's done is basically in the lumbar spine. And sometimes it's a pure epidural. Other times it's combined with a spinal in which we go one step further and we inject the medications also inside the subarachnoid space. But for the purposes of this conversation, let's talk about the epidural itself. So let's imagine that this is the spine. A lot of times we want to have the patient in a fetal position because that will open up the spaces in between the vertebra and that's where the needle is going to go. So let's pretend that this is the needle in question. Then obviously initially we give a lot of local anesthetic in this region and that's going to be the worst part of the procedure because you're going to feel that poke and the lidocaine being injected. However, after that, when we go in with the actual spinal needle, that's going to be very well tolerated and you probably won't feel a thing. So let's imagine that this is the space in question then basically we would go in with the needle and then as we are going in, initially we are going through a lot of thick tissue, ligament, for example. And when we're going through ligament, the needle itself will feel that resistance. So we usually have a syringe with air in it or saline that's attached to the needle and we keep pushing on the plunger to see if there's going to be any resistance loss or not. And as you can imagine, if you are in a very thick tissue or dense tissue like a ligament, then you won't really be able to inject that air. However, as soon as we reach the epidural space, the epidural space is mostly made of fat, then as soon as the needle tip hits that space, there is a loss of resistance. So the air that's inside the syringe is released, and that's how we know that we're actually inside the epidural space. And then we can thread a catheter that goes up a little bit, depending on the level that we need for the given indication. And with that catheter, we're able to inject the medications that we need, which most often are a mix of a local anesthetic, like a bupivacaine, and then opioid, like fentanyl. And the idea behind injecting two different medications is that it allows us to use lower volumes and concentrations of those medications in such a way as to lead to a sensory block so that you're not feeling pain, but not lead to a motor block so that you can still move despite the epidural. Now, the catheter itself is marked so that we know exactly how much distance it has traveled and so that we can keep monitoring that and make sure it wasn't displaced afterward. And usually once the patient has delivered or let's say a day or two or several days afterward, the catheter will need to be removed once the pain control is no longer needed. When we use the catheter, that gives us the option of infusing the medications for as many hours or days as we need to. So it could be several days or even a week if it's after an abdominal surgery, for example. And then it just needs to be taken out afterward, which is your doctor will just pull it out and make sure that there's no retained pieces inside. Okay, so now let's talk about the risks of epidurals. 
The most feared risks and the most severe complications that can happen after an epidural include a spinal hematoma. So that's when you have essentially a blood formation in the epidural space where the injection was, but that's very rare. So it's basically about one in a hundred thousand epidurals. And sometimes there are risk factors for it, like eating disorders and coagulopathies. Also extremely uncommon would be an infection. So like an epidural abscess. Local anesthetic toxicity, also pretty rare. A little bit more common than that would be itching. So pruritus can happen because of the opioid. That's one of the common side effects of opioids. So you might feel some itching. And then another side effect that can happen is a motor block. So if the concentration of the local anesthetic or the volume that was used is higher than it should be, for example, to achieve proper pain control, it might lead to a motor block, which essentially means that you will have some weakness in your legs after the procedure, but that should go away when the infusion of the medication has been stopped. Now, one of the most feared and relatively common complications of an epidural or a spinal is what is called a spinal headache. Now, how does that happen? Basically, there's two ways for it to happen. If we are basically trying to do an epidural, then we theoretically should be outside of the dura by definition. However, if inadvertently we go deeper than we should, then we can puncture the dura and lead to a leak. So that is essentially one way that you can get a spinal headache. The other way is if it was an actual spinal, where by definition you have to penetrate the dura. And in that case, you're definitely going to have a hole in the dura that's leaking CSF. However, the size of the needle makes a huge difference. When we're doing a spinal, whether that's a spinal anesthesia or a lumbar puncture, essentially the needle itself is a spinal needle with a very thin diameter so that the hole that we're causing is small. So in those cases, usually between 1.5 to 11% is the risk of having a spinal headache. So it's not a very high number. However, in cases of inadvertent dural leak that is happening because the intent was an epidural placement, but the needle went deeper. So that only happens in about 1.5% of epidurals. But in those 1.5%, the risk of having a spinal headache is about 52% based on meta-analyses and reviews. And the reason for that is that the needle itself that's used for an epidural is much bigger than the needle that we would use for a spinal. And that's because sometimes we need to pass a catheter inside it. So it needs to be big enough to allow for that passage. Now, if a spinal headache has happened for whatever reason, then I usually give it time. So most often we go for conservative treatment for up to seven days, and that would be a mix of hydration, caffeine, which actually helps a lot with this kind of headache, and NSAIDs to see if that's potentially going to resolve the symptoms. But if the symptoms don't resolve, or if let's say the symptoms are very severe in the first few days after the dural leak, then in that case, the treatment would be a, what we call an epidural blood patch. And the idea behind it is that it's similar to the epidural that was initially done, However, when we go in with the needle, instead of injecting the local anesthetic or the opioid, then we would be injecting your own blood. So we would take blood from your arm and then we would inject 20 or 30 cc's of that same blood in the location of the epidural where the leak would have happened. And then that blood would clot and seal the hole. That's the idea behind it. But again, remember, we don't always need to do that. We only do it in cases that did not respond to conservative management. Now, how do you know that you have a spinal headache? So usually the most important thing about it is that it's very positional. So that's one of the very few headaches where basically if you are lying on your back, you have no headache. But as soon as you try to sit up or stand up, the headache goes from, let's say, 0 to 10 out of 10. So that positional component of the headache or orthostatic component is, is crucial in identifying it. And obviously, it needs to be time-locked to some sort of spinal injection in the previous days. Okay, so now in the last part of the video, I want to talk about the other type of epidural, and that is essentially epidural steroid injections. So what is an epidural steroid injection? Basically, you do this for patients who have disc pain. So refer back to my video on low back pain and the different types of low back pain. But essentially, if you have pain coming from the disc or a disc herniation, that's especially if it's compressing the nerve root next to it and leading to pain shooting down the leg, or if you have spinal stenosis, so narrowing of the canal, where the nerves are exiting, then that can lead to pain and inflammation. So we go in with a needle, the same epidural needle, which is a two-way needle, and then we go in and then we inject the steroid to decrease the inflammation and to flush out all the inflammatory mediators that are happening around that site. Now, the two main differences between that epidural and the epidural we just talked about in labor and delivery is basically that we use fluoroscopy because obviously we don't have a fetus, we don't have to worry about radiation in that case. So we can place the patient on a table and use an x-ray machine, a C-arm, so that we can actually identify the spinal elements and then we can see exactly 
exactly which space we want to go into that makes it a much more targeted approach to actually be able to inject into the epidural space because we use contrast dye to identify the epidural space. So as soon as we get the loss of resistance that we talked about earlier, we inject contrast dye and that dye will have a distinct pattern if it's in the epidural space. And if we find that pattern, then we inject the medication afterward. So that's the main difference. And obviously we cannot do that in labor and delivery because of radiation. And then the second difference is what's being injected. So in the epidural that we talked about for obstetrics, we're basically spreading a catheter and infusing a local anesthetic and opioid to help with the pain throughout the process. However, for the intent of an epidural steroid injection, like the name implies, we are injecting a steroid, so cortisone. And that can be dexamethasone, it can be dapomedrol, it can be canalog, any of those. And the idea behind it is that we're trying to decrease the inflammation and uh, around that disc or around the nerve root. And we are trying to flush out all the inflammatory mediators. And we're not threading a catheter in that case, it's a single shot. For those, usually patients can safely get up to four per year. So four epidurals per year, which is usually about every three months because they don't last forever. But that's another topic I'll discuss in a separate video. All right, that's it. I hope that this video has helped you demystify the word epidural and the procedure itself. At some point in the future, I'll try to tape a video of the procedure itself on a real patient to show you exactly what things look like and that might help you better understand what to expect. Thanks again for your attention and stay safe.